This conference will now be recorded. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Dane County Regional Airport's PFAS informational presentation. As you know, we planned on having a meeting to uh, discuss this, this information with the public. And unfortunately, the pandemic has, has put us in a situation where we're not able to do that. So instead, we're going to have a virtual presentation. We're going to share what we know, what we're doing about it, and where we go from here. So Dean, if you would please take us to the next slide. With me today, I have uh, Amy Tutwiler, who is a member of Dane County Corporation's Council Office, and Dean Maricus, who is a PFAS expert with Mead and Hunt. Um, many of you know that I've been with the airport now for going on 17 years. Um, and before that, I was with another airport in Iowa. So I bring a lot of experience to the table in dealing with a variety of situations that can happen at airports. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass this over to Amy for a brief introduction as well. Hi, everyone. My name is Amy Tutwiler. As Kim mentioned, I'm with the Dane County Corporation Counsel's Office. I'm an attorney in that office, and I'm helping the airport through the PFAS challenges uh, based on my background. I have a master's degree in environmental studies and experience over the years working on contaminated sites throughout Wisconsin. Thanks, Amy. And now, Dean, I'm going to pass the entire presentation over to you for you to give us an introduction and then proceed with presenting the um, PowerPoint. Thank you so Thank much, you. everybody. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, my name is Dean Maricus. I'm with Mead and Hunt. Um, I'm a senior aviation environmental consultant with the firm. I've been dealing with airport water issues uh, since about 1992. Uh, since about 2014, I've been involved in PFAS issues at airports across the United States. Uh, in 2017, I had the honor of being a co-author on the National Academy of Sciences guidebook on PFAS and airports. It basically provides mostly commercial airports with guidance on understanding what PFAS is about and how they can go about getting their arms around the problem and, and doing something about it. So I wanted to start today with um, a brief history of PFAS. Um, this is actually a, a family of chemicals as opposed to a particular chemical. Uh, last count, they're in excess of 5,500 PFAS chemicals. They were first developed by 3M in the late 1940s and began to appear in a variety of products in the 1950s. Uh, over the subsequent 70 oh, some odd years, They've been used in a wide range of everyday items, ranging from uh, things like uh, shampoos, nonstick uh, cookware, fast food uh, packaging, also industrial products such as pesticides, photographic chemicals, and even firefighting foams, which is really the topic of interest from the perspective of the airport. These are called aqueous film forming foams and I'll be talking a bit more about them in a few minutes. The uh, issue regarding PFAS is that they were really designed from the outset, outset to be very durable chemicals. And that's one of the reasons they do such a great job. The Teflon in your nonstick plant, pan does a great job because it stands up to the heat of cooking and still uh, performs as a nonstick uh, coating. Uh, unfortunately, those chemicals are also very resistant to breaking down in the environment, and as a consequence, they're also often referred to as forever chemicals. They're very resistant to biodegradation, chemical breakdown, and even high temperature heat. And that, that's uh, really the heart of the, the characteristics of this whole family of chemicals. Uh, they've been in widespread use over a long period of time, and they stick around. They're persistent. And as a consequence, they're ubiquitous in the environment. And in fact, in the 1980s, 3M did a study and reported it back to EPA that they estimated every man, woman, and child in the United States had detectable concentrations of PFAS in their blood. Now, um, the, the ubiquitousness of these chemicals alone wouldn't be an issue. Unfortunately, studies in recent years have shown that um, there are a number of human health effects that have been implicated. 
In particular, there are two chemicals, PFOA and PFOS, that have been of greatest concern. And these are the ones uh, that we'll be focusing on our discussion later. If you want to learn more about this, the first one of the best places to start is US EPA's website on the topic. And you see the, the URL there at the bottom of the screen. Now, when you've got a, um, an environmental problem, one of the first things you want to look at is what are the, the standards, the regulatory requirements for cleaning up? It gives you those regulations give you an idea of how clean or how cleaned up a site or a, a body of water needs to be to be uh, to pass ecological and, and human health standards. Unfortunately, at this current time, there's very limited federal and state regulation of PFAS. At the national level, the best we have at the moment is uh, a lifetime exposure guideline that EPA issued back in 2016 for drinking water. And it's 70 parts per trillion for a combination of PFOA and PFOS. These are the two chemicals I alluded to a moment ago that are of greatest concern. Uh, the, it's a couple of things to keep in mind in understanding what this guideline means. First of all, it's for drinking water. It doesn't apply to stormwater, doesn't apply to rivers, lakes, and, and so forth. Secondly, it's a lifetime exposure basis for the, the risk. In other words, uh, the guideline that they've provided uh, is applicable if uh, a person were to drink water um, at that level for a lifetime. And as you see on the right-hand side, that works out to uh, eight glasses of water a day, roughly 3,000 glasses of water in a year, and almost a quarter million glasses of water in, in a typical lifetime. Concent drinking water below these concentrations, but below the guideline, uh, basically uh, does not have an indicated risk uh, based on EPA's analysis. Now, a variety of states, including EPA, are working on actual regulatory standards. And in Wisconsin, the Department of Natural Resources and Department of Health Services are working on a state level standard, and that'd be a, a legal requirement for P PFO and PFOS. Um, it's anticipated to be significantly lower than EPA's health guideline, and that reflects ongoing scientific research and understanding of the effects of these chemicals. Unfortunately, the rulemaking process can take several years, so we're not looking at a state standard anytime in the very near future, although we can certainly see it on the horizon. In the meantime, and in the absence of legal standards, the only thing we've got in the state of uh, Wisconsin to work with is advisory guidelines that the state has issued at 20 parts per trillion. And that again is for PFOA and PFOS. So it's comparable to EPA's uh, human health standard or guideline. Now let's look a little bit at, at the current and past use of PFAS at the airport. All of the, the PFAS usage is associated with the use of this AFFF foam uh, that's used by the, the airport's firefighting uh, operations. AFFF has contained PFAS since its first use, or containing PFAS, um, first started in the 1970s. It was actually in the late 60s that the Navy uh, instigated the, the development of this product specifically to be effective in putting out fires that were fuel, is um, like oils, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, and so forth, is the burning uh, material. Uh, this product works extremely well at putting out those kinds of fires. And in fact, so well that FAA and the Department of Defense um, basically mandated the use of AFFF containing PFAS in emergencies at commercial airports as well as military facilities uh, around the world. In the, in the past, usage of AFFF at the airport has uh, gone beyond just emergencies, although emergencies are by far the largest volume use of AFFF. FAA requires uh, on a regular basis that firefighting equipment be calibrated and pass certain certification tests. In addition, in the past, training was required on site. Uh, the training was, was moved off site many years ago. In 2016, the on site testing that was required by FAA in terms of the equipment was uh, the procedures for that were changed such that any AFFF that was uh, expended or used during the testing was contained, cleaned up, and properly disposed of so it wouldn't be released to the environment. 
In 2019, FAA allowed new procedures that actually eliminated the use of AFFF as part of the equipment testing and certification. And so today, the only time AFFF is used at the airport is for emergency situations, a crash or some other kind of fire response out on the airfield. And today, uh, all of those activities are undertaken by the Wisconsin Air National Guard. Now, the good news on the horizon is that even though currently PFAS-based AFFF is mandated by uh, FAA, uh, FAA has also been given a directive by Congress to allow alternatives to a triple F containing PFAS no later than October of next year. So within that time frame, commercial airports will be allowed to switch to PFAS free uh, a triple F. Uh, the other good news is there's already products around the world that are used by other commercial airports in other countries, as well as militaries uh, in other countries. Uh, effective firefighting foams that do not contain PFAS. So once it's allowed by FAA, uh, we're anticipating the transition will occur pretty quickly. Now, looking back historically then, the, the biggest issue we're facing is um, legacy contamination from past practices, since we're no longer uh, using AFFF except in, in absolute emergencies. And then tracing the use um, of the materials is a little complicated, uh, in part because a number of entities have been responsible for firefighting at the airport over the years. Uh, in addition, uh, local fire departments have used a couple of fire uh, burn pits on site for fire training. And so one of our ongoing activities is compiling as much information as possible on historical records regarding who used what, where, how much, and so forth. This is involving not only looking at records, but we're trying to track down and interview people who worked at the airport using AFFF, so we have the best possible idea of where the material was used. And PFAS isn't only an issue at the airport. Uh, PFAS investigations around Madison began, began several years ago. Uh, the city uh, sampled 23 drinking water wells, 14 of which uh, were shown to have detectable concentrations of PFAS. Fortunately, those concentrations were pretty low. The worst of them was well 15, which showed concentrations well below what EPA's uh, guideline is. Uh, but in an abundance of caution, the city decided to stop using that well until they have a better understanding of the evolving science and evolving regulatory environment. You can find more information on the city's program for PFAS uh, at their website. Again, the URL is shown at the bottom of the screen. So in terms of the airport's uh, investigations, there's actually a number of organizations investigating PFAS uh, at Dane County Regional Airport. The county itself, Wisconsin Air National Guard, and the city of Madison are all conducting concurrent uh, activities involving PFAS. All of these activities are being done under work plans that have been approved by DNR. And the important thing there is uh, by having these work plans coordinated and approved by the state, we all know that we're focusing on the right questions to be answered and we're doing the right things from the perspective of, of DNR. Our efforts to date have included some extensive field sampling. And on the right, you'll see a, a map of the airport with drainage basins and those red dots represent locations in the storm sewer system at the airport where we've collected samples and analyzed them for PFAS. As part of that effort, we identified a couple of hot spots. And by that, I mean locations where the concentrations of PFAS were really significantly higher than other locations around the airport. As part of this effort, we're evaluating innovative technologies to remove PFAS from the stormwater system. And the, one of the challenges in dealing with this problem is it's relatively new and the technology for treating PFAS is relatively new, especially in a stormwater context. So we've been trying to get out there and look at the research that's being done, talk to vendors and see what's coming on the market in terms of potentially applicable technologies. We've identified one of those technologies as a candidate and actually taking the advantage uh, or taking the opportunity to imp implement it at one of the hotspots that we identified in the airfield that will be in place for about two months. Uh, we'll be collecting samples 
upstream and downstream of the treatment unit and trying to get a quantitative idea of how it's performing in, term, in terms of removing PFAS from stormwater. If the performance looks good, we'll continue uh, with the operation of that technology at that location and look at where else on the airport we might be able to implement it. If it turns out that it's not performing well, well, we'll, we'll know then that it's not worth spending more time and money on that and we'll continue to look for other technologies that might have promise at the airport and then look at a process of, of implementing those as, as appropriate. We're also doing expanded stormwater sampling we want to make sure we're not making decisions just based on a single snapshot. We're also investigating the training burn pits that I, I mentioned earlier, taking soil samples and groundwater samples as well to see if in the past, did they use PFAS foams? They may or may not have, we don't know. Some municipal uh, fire departments do use AFFF. In small quantities, they have it on, on hand to deal with things like vehicle fires where fuel might be involved. As I mentioned, we're researching past AFFF use. And all of this is ultimately leading to the ability to implement a short, mid, and long-term remediation efforts at the airport. Because the, the bottom line is we want to find ways of reducing discharges of PFAS into the surrounding environment. So with that, I'll turn it back to Kim. Dean, thanks for that information. At this point, it's important for the community to know that the Dane County Regional Airport in Dane County is committed to ensuring that cleanup occurs and that it's done so responsibly. Uh, one of the issues that we faced recently with the timeline on that is, is the pandemic. It has created limitations to um, some of our partners in terms of their travel, uh, lab turnaround times. Uh, one of the companies that we're working with uh, converted their operations over to make masks to address um, protective uh, personal equipment for um, health care providers and others during the pandemic. All of those things led to delays to the process as we originally anticipated. However, we're moving forward with that uh, whole process now. We'll be um, issuing a request for proposals for an actual remediation contractor to lead with the cleanup work and coordinate uh, with Mead and Hunt on the, the follow-up investigation that they've been doing. We will continue to sample across the airfield and look at new technologies, which uh, is one of the, the areas that we are hoping to see some great advancement in. Um, We'll continue to provide updates to the DNR and the Madison community as they become available. It's important that we, we are transparent with this information and share it as soon as possible with the community. Um, Amy Tutwiler will join us again now and will be uh, providing some additional information and resources. Thank you, Ken. You can find additional information below uh, this video on the Dane County Airport website, and the link is shown here on this slide. Also, you can submit questions through the Frequently Asked Questions submission process. We have a form on the web page as well. We will be accepting questions for two weeks following the initial release of this video. Um, and I just ask that you please look at the FAQs that are already on the website to see whether your question has already been answered. Um, finally, we'll be conducting a virtual meeting. Uh, it's a public comment meeting after the answers are posted. So um, again, please check back soon for more information on the date and time. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. With that, I would like to encourage everyone to go back, review the information that's been presented, um, link through to other resources, compile questions that you may have and submit them uh, to the airport's website for further follow-up. We look forward to having um, an additional opportunity to meet with the public uh, virtually and go from there. So thank you so much and Look forward to, to meeting you all again in the future.